What's up everybody, JJ here. Today we are reviewing the Inder 5 S1. It's a weird printer at a weird price. I don't really know why this printer exists, but they sent it and I've been using it for a few months and we're gonna check it out. And I'm really glad I spent a few months on this review because I've got a lot to talk about. But first up, I wanted to thank everyone. We reached 100,000 subscribers. I got that plaque back there. Thank you all so much for watching and subscribing, liking. It means so much to me. Thank you. First off, when talking about this printer, it's important to keep the price in mind. And it's going to scare a lot of people away. $560. And so is it worth that when you can get the Ender 3 S1 for $330? Is this huge price premium worth it? No, but we're going to get into that. So let's go down their specs, and check it out. Well, we need to review this in stock configuration so you don't get a PEI coated bed. In stock configuration, it comes with this polycarbonate bed. And if anyone has seen my shorts, you know how much I dislike this bed. It sticks way too hard. It's damaged from every, you can see every single print I've done on here because it embeds itself and damages the bed every time you remove that print. It is flexible, but a lot of times it doesn't flex enough to be able to remove it. It's just holding on way too strongly. When you can buy a PEI bed at 20 to $30, those are amazing. They hold on well when they're hot. They release really easily when it's cold. You should just upgrade to one of those. So they cheap down on the bed. Build volume, is it very big? You get 220 by 220 by 280. Pretty standard build volume, very similar to the Ender 3. That's not a good look. Direct drive, all metal hot end. That's pretty standard. You got a CR Touch auto bed leveling system. That's nice to see on a printer, but in 2023, both of those features are pretty standard on most printers. It comes in this box frame, and that's really all you're getting as an upgrade from the Ender 3. It is a box and it should be really stable and it should be really good at high speed printing, but they put a Cartesian motion system on here. So this motor, moves the X axis and this motor back here moves the Y axis. Even though it is a box and would make Core XY really easy to implement on this frame, they didn't do it. It's still a Cartesian system. There's a bunch of different differences between Cartesian and Core XY. Core XY is just generally better at high speed printing. And there's other videos that would explain it in more detail. In general, it's just better at high speed printing. Cartesian is fine especially at cheaper printers. But an expensive printer like this that's still using Cartesian, it's like, why am I spending so much money on it? They're still using V-slot wheels on here. They're not using linear rods or linear rails. They do have linear rods on the Z-axis, which is good to see. But these wheels are already starting to wear out on me. At least this one is really starting to wear out and I haven't been using it all that much. Well, is it very good at high-speed printing? Because they do advertise a ton saying it's a high-speed printer. But then those numbers they put out there aren't all that good. They say 2,000 millimeters per second squared acceleration. If you were to go up to the Bamboo Labs P1P, which is a $700 printer, they're giving you 20,000 millimeters per second squared acceleration. So it makes 2,000 look really bad at $560. Speed-wise, they claim you can print up to 260 millimeters per second. This Porygon was printed, outer walls were printed at 60 millimeters per second. And this is how bad the ringing is on here. It's just a lot of ringing and artifacts that are showing up at slower speeds. Here's some other examples of just pretty poor print quality. This is with silk filament, so it's gonna show off those results. They're stock benchy. They do come with a pre-loaded, pre-sliced benchy on there, and it turns out well, but it takes close to an hour to print that benchy. That is not a speed benchy. A be speed benchy, I would call 30 minutes or under, gets into the realm of speed benchies. They're not amazing world-class or anything. When in the 45 to an hour range of benchies, that's a pretty standard benchy. So when it comes to the specs of this printer, pretty normal in a lot of ways. It just comes with this box frame on it that makes it more stable. When it comes to the usability of this printer, full size SD card on this side, I do like that. A lot of printers use micro SD cards and those can be a little more fiddly. On switches on the left, the filament loads up through this filament runout detector, up through, this is called a reverse Bowden tube when it's a direct drive, but you still have this Bowden tube feeding over to the spool. Weird design on the top here that doesn't hold onto the Bowden tube very well, so it just slides out really easily. If you're trying to push filament up through this side, that force will just pop this out. 
kind of a weird design there. When it comes to actually using the touchscreen here, it's a nice big touchscreen, pretty standard on a lot of printers, but there's one big downside and I think you'll notice it as soon as I start showing you how to use it. Did you notice that beep? It's very loud. And every single time you press anything on the touchscreen, it beeps at you to let you know you've pressed a button, I guess, and there's no way to turn it off, which is super annoying. It's louder than the print fans are. I thought the printer fans were fairly loud, but this beeper wins the cake with how shrill it is. It's really annoying to use that touchscreen. If I was gonna keep this printer around, I would go in there and desolder that buzzer so that it wouldn't be doing this. And you have to input a lot of commands to change filament or start a print and it's gonna be beeping at you every single time. So that is really annoying. The next weird part of this printer is how loud it is at high speeds. And I'm not even talking about the fans. The fans are fairly loud, but a fan noise should be pretty constant. Honestly, I'm okay with it. These motors are loud. When you try to push it 100, 150 millimeters per second, they start squealing at you. <laughs> Something's weird here where when it, you start pushing the speeds, it gets loud again. And I think that has to do with how the stepper motor drivers are configured. At least in my usage of Clipper, if you set those configurations wrong, it can leave stealth chop and enter spread cycle. It's a different way of controlling motors and can make them loud again, the whole switching from one to the other, which can happen if the stepper motor drivers are not set up correctly for what you're trying to do. At least that's my theory on why it's happening that way. In general, it's just loud at high speeds. The motors are squealing at you when it tries to get up to high speeds. So while I have been pretty negative about this printer, I have got some pretty good prints off of it. And there are some good things I can say as well. I wanna make this a well-rounded review. Their Cura profile is set up really well. Creality's been around for a while and the community has been working on their profile for so long. That's something you can't say for other companies. When you get their Cura profile for their printer, you still need to do a lot of tuning. This one right out of the box worked, but it was pretty slow compared to what they advertised. A big part of my complaints with the speed on this printer is just their advertising is saying, hey, it's all these amazing fast things, when in reality, it's not an amazing speed printer. It's a fine, normal speed printer. Reliability is pretty good. This extruder on here is really heavy, but it works pretty well. Overall, there are a lot of benefits to having a bed razor like this instead of a normal bed slinger printer. Um, I do like these for taking time-lapse videos of your print being printed, but the problem is the price point here. I always say when looking at the price of printers, $200 is an entry-level printer. You might be missing some features there, but that's your cheapest you probably should go. $300, adds a lot of great features. You should get auto bed leveling. You should get direct drive at around that $300. 400 to get even better. But then this one coming in at almost $600 is not great. If you bump it up a little bit more for the $700, you get the Bamboo Labs P1P. That one has its own issues. It's not a perfect printer for $700. But when you look at those specs versus these specs, there's a lot of reasons to sort of bump up to that one. So when summing this printer up, I would say skip it. Go for something more expensive or something cheaper that will give you the same specs as this. If you own this printer right now, keep using it. You don't need to sell it to try to get a better printer. If it's working well for you, enjoy it, use it. If you got it and it's not working well for you, maybe you can return it. If you could get this for 400 to 450, that'd be maybe $100 over the Ender 3. I think this could be a really good price. If they put a pro version of this out that put a better build plate on here, remove the beeper on there, put linear rails on here, Core XY, I don't think they're gonna do that, but there's so many things they could have put on here at this price point to make this a better printer. But right now, at this price point, it's not a great purchase. Anyway, I hope this review has helped you out. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button down below so more companies will send me more printers and I can let you know how they really are to use. Well, that's one down and I've got several more printers around here I've got to review. Go out there, create something amazing today, and I'll see you in the next video.